Okay, so we will begin by starting with the uh, most elementary circuits that we would have uh, started with as an electrical engineer. We start with DC circuits which has a source that is represented by a battery. Okay. It has some series internal resistance associated with it, right. So we can mark this as V source. This is the series internal resistance of the battery itself. Let us assume that there is a switch and there is a wire that is connecting it to another resistor. This is probably one of the first circuits that we come across in electrical engineering. We try to learn Ohm's law and the loop, uh, Kirchhoff's voltage law, etc. So I will mark this as RL and I will mark this as a switch which opens and closes, okay. can make contact or break contact depending on the time. Now when we look at this uh, circuit, we can identify that this part is a source, the other part is a sink or a load and the part in between that connects them is what we are going to focus on a little bit, these are going to be the wires. Now if we were to close this switch, okay, we would expect that the there is a path for the current to flow and the voltage is going to be divided between this resistance RS and this resistance RL and we write down the Ohm's law and the Kirchhoff's voltage law for this. But one of the things that we do not do is when we treat this as a basic circuit, we are not putting some important information over here. So to illustrate that I will redraw this circuit in a slightly different way to just make you understand where I am getting. So I will draw the same source with a series resistance which is internal to the battery and I am having a switch that makes or breaks contact but drawing a very long wire to connect this resistor. So I will mark the quantities once again, source voltage, series internal resistance, a switch that opens and closes and then we have sink or a load, alright. Strictly speaking in low frequency circuits, these wires would act like short circuits. So the lengths are typically not at all mentioned and you do not get a feel for them when you are looking at a circuit diagram. For all we know, the source could be placed very far off from the sink, alright. So there is a difference between these two circuits once you start incorporating the dimension of space inside your circuit diagrams. And the question is when is it important and when you can avoid using space inside your basic circuit diagrams, alright. Now when you have an abnormally long wired connection like this in your basic circuits, a question that crosses the mind is suppose you close this uh, switch, a voltage will start appearing at this point and we mark this point with some coordinates, alright. The voltage between the two wires at this point, alright. So we can mark this to be AB and the load coordinates can be marked as BC or CD, right. At the instant when you are closing, in low frequency circuits, the assumption is that the voltage VAB is going to be equal to the voltage VCD. That is the assumption that you make in your low frequency circuits. But we know that no signal including the fastest signal that we know which is light can travel at infinite speed. There has to be a finite speed for a signal to travel from one place to another place, okay. Which means that at the moment when the voltage at VAB is non-zero immediately after you close the switch, if your wire is very, very long, then the voltage across the point VCD, alright, is going to be different. Which means that between the two edges, you are going to be having a difference in voltages and this has to be considered. And when do we consider and when do we not consider is the question that we are going to be answering now. All right. So we already know that if your wires are going to be extremely long, you will have to start to consider the effect of space. 
you will have to start to consider the effect of time because of a finite velocity as associated with the signal. Now, uh, when does it become important, right? Suppose you are going to be having a PCB board. which has some pins. So, this is an IC on a PCB board which has some pins and I have another IC ok. And let us say that now this is going to be your source. And let us say that this is going to be our sink or load. So, information is traveling from left to right over here. There could be some interconnections between these pins, all right. Now, <coughs> there are also many other ways the pins can be connected. For example, you can loop. All right, you can have a ground pin that is looped which means that you will be having something over here which will be coming to this side. This is a loop. So, it forms this could be a ground pin, this could also be a ground pin, but they are on the same layer of the PCB. So, you have a current that will flow on the top line and completing the circuit to the bottom line. This is known as a loop. Usually, a loop is avoided in an integrated circuit design. So, what they do instead is they have a ground plane below the PCB board and the ground is usually connected by Vs. So, that you have the current flowing on the top layer of the PCB and the return path is usually at the bottom layer of the PCB. This could be taken as one particular example, right. Now, in this case, we are having two different lines. It is also possible that the two different lines could have two different lengths, all right. If that is the case, this circuit needs to make a decision based on the inputs at some instant of time. So, a knowledge of the delay between these lines is going to be important. If one of the lines is going to be shorter than the other line, you will need to be aware of it to make a quick decision first. Even in the simplest case when you are using logic gates for example, an AND gate and an OR gate etcetera, the assumption that you make is both the inputs occur at the same time across the two pins, but it is quite possible that the signals will appear at different slightly different instants of time, ok. So, we are going to consider cases where this length and the time delay are critical, all right. And it seems that there is a way we can figure out when it is critical and when it is not. So, we will go back to our circuit that we had drawn, right, and we will try to just make a fine distinction as to when it is critical and when it is not, ok. So, most of the communication happens in terms of uh, frequencies, that means you have a periodic signal instead of a simple switch that is closing and opening. Right. So, we can start by using an AC source instead of a battery, right. It has an internal resistance, ok. And then you have a long interconnect connected to a load resistor. So, in this particular case, we already know that the signal velocity is not going to be infinite due to physical constraints, right. So, that means that there is a finite velocity with which the signal is going to travel and that means that we have to talk about some time that uh, the signal takes to go from A, B to C, D. We call this as uh, transit time, right. and it is usually represented by tau. The signal velocity, let us say that it is V, ok. And since this is a sinusoid, we can expect that between the points A, B and C, D, there is a good chance that there is a phase difference, ok. Now, usually when we think about phase difference, we only think between 0 and 2 pi, but one has to understand that 4 pi, 6 pi are also phase differences just because they are multiples, you do not actually observe them, but there is actually a delay, all right. So, there is going to be a phase difference between the signal that is coming at A, B and C, D. 
Now in conventional circuits, either when you deal with DC circuits like what we had planned, right, what we had begun with or in AC circuits, the assumption is this is shorted so the voltage drop across AB and CD are identical. Then you can use your conventional circuit laws which is Kirchhoff's current law and voltage law. In this particular case, if you try to apply KCL because your wire length is very long, you will start having drops across your short circuit itself which will violate your basic input output criteria. So the approach to do uh, circuit analysis with lines that are long or have transit times that are large is by using what is known as transmission line theory. Now for the first time in the circuit diagram, we are adding some uh, notations. Let us say that the length of the short circuit that you are seeing is L. So previously our circuit diagram did not have length marked on it, never, previously it did not have time marked on it, previously it did not have velocity marked on it, okay. Now we are marking some more quantities and we can say that uh, the transit time is tau and it is simply the length divided by the velocity v, right? okay. Now, there are some cases that we have to look at, okay. If the frequency of source Vs is very low, if the frequency is very low, okay, that means we can say that your velocity is going to be the product of your frequency of the source Fs. So let us say that this is okay and consequently the signal now has a wavelength lambda s and the relationship between the velocity and the wavelength is velocity is equal to frequency times wavelength okay and uh, if your frequency is very low all right. means that the wavelength is going to be really high, okay. It also means that your signal is going to be, uh, you know, not showing any significant phase difference between the points AB and CD, right. So in this case, one can always use low frequency circuit analysis. However, if you are having the frequency of source Vs to be high, okay, then you can write down the velocity is going to be Fs lambda s and Fs is going down, Fs is going high. implies that your wavelength is going down. That means it can probably fit multiple waves within the same line, all right. And it is quite possible that you will have an enormous phase difference between the points AB and CD in your circuit diagram. Now in this course, we are going to be focusing on the second case, which is going to be high frequency circuit analysis, all right. And uh, we are going to not invent a new theory for it. We are going to see how we can take the uh, existing theory for low frequency circuit analysis and actually apply it for the high frequency circuit analysis as we want in this course, okay. So one of the approaches that we could take is divide this into a number of small regions, right. So you could always mark this to be some small sections. All right, and if we call this direction with the coordinate z, you can say that we are uniformly gridding the wire with a spacing of delta z. Okay, 
and the choice of delta z is such that there is no phase difference or no time delay between the left hand side and the right hand side of that section of the wire it's really tiny so the delay is really really tiny if that is the case for each of these sections you will be able to apply low frequency circuit analysis or kirchhoff's current law so that is the approach that we are going to start with but the question becomes non trivial when you look at it as even though if you divide it as sections okay and even though we have considered a short circuit there is actually a delay right so in this particular case i have not drawn any resistance for the wires these are short circuits these are ideal circuits i mean ideal interconnects and you don't have any resistance connected to it but there is a delay all right so we have to explain this delay and from low frequency circuit analysis we already know that we can use rc rl and usually rc is considered to be a time delay and rl will also give a time delay which gives us a hint actually that there is more than simple wire present over here okay you have to account for this delay by making use of some lnc all right and we also learnt in our earlier circuit analysis courses that rc is known as a time constant okay if you don't have any resistance your time constant will vanish that means that you need to have some small resistance present in your circuit right to begin with then if that is the case what will the circuit model for each of the small sections look like and what are the approximations that we can make to make our solutions little bit easier so first thing. now this is a wire carrying the wire i mean a uh, carrying current on the top a wire carrying current in the bottom all right and we started with a specific example where we are having say two ic's on a pcb that are interconnected like this and the ground plane is below them okay if uh, this is the case we can say that the wire is carrying some current that is time varying all right it is going to have some self inductance obviously the wires are spaced apart all right and in the case of your pcb they are present in top and the bottom layer separated by a dielectric there is some like a capacitor in cross section so there is a capacitance that is coming into the picture and there is also some small finite resistance associated with copper traces that goes on pcbs right so this resistance is going to be present along the wire and no dielectric is ideal so even though you have a trace on the top layer of the pcb and a ground plane at the bottom of the pcb you cannot apply infinitely large voltage there is going to be some breakdown at some point and even if you apply sufficiently small voltage you cannot say that the dielectric is ideal it is going to have some small valley of current trickling down from top to bottom so there is a tiny valley of resistance which is present there so by making use of this analogy we can start to build some models which are known as phenomenological models okay okay the more accurate it becomes it will be known as a physical model all right but it is not empirical as yet because we are not basing this simply based on measurements we are associating some uh signs to it to build this model right? it's based on some phenomenon here the phenomenon that we are observing is transit time velocity and the fact that even if you uh break down the circuit into small chunks you still need to have some small tiny resistances present okay if that is the case what would that be right so we'll be having the equivalent circuit for that interconnect to be having say a small in inductor a tiny capacitance present between the top and the bottom line so this is the top line and this is the return path okay then you will have an inductor and a capacitor but this means that we have drawn everything ideal and once again the question of delay becomes question i mean becomes uh, unclear so the way to start analyzing this is by starting with an elaborate circuit and actually crossing out quantities which will help us to arrive at a simpler solution so we know that there is an rc rl effect because of the delay so we can say that we can start with an rl right and then we will have a resistance between the top and the bottom lines and a capacitance between the top and the bottom lines 
and this unit keeps repeating again and again in each small section forms what is known as a ladder network okay and we can call this series resistance to be r this is l this to be a conductance g this is a capacitance so it's r l g c okay keep in mind that we are still using bulk quantities like r l g and c so the unit of r is in ohms L is going to be in Henry's, G is going to be in Siemens, C is going to be in Farad's, right? But we know that these are divided into small sections, and usually, if you are buying a coaxial cable or if you are designing PCBs, you are worried about the length, and you are also worried about the value of these quantities per unit length, because now you are dividing it uh, in small sections, right? So we'll have to come up with some way to say that this section. the length is delta z if that is the case we'll have to say that this r is going to be a distributed parameter okay and we can say that this r is some oops delta z okay so this represents some bulk re uh, single resistance that we have put in the circuit actually the resistance is present throughout the line so if this is the case then we have to say that this is going to be in ohms per meter and this is going to be in meters and put together for a given section of the line you will be able to calculate the resistance for that entire section similarly each of these quantities are for a specific section right so we'll have to say that distributed inductance means that l is going to be l times delta z and similarly you will be having g is g times delta z and capacitance is the moment you start writing down quantities all right which involve a per meter for example here the unit is going to be henry per meter here it is going to be siemens per meter and here it is going to be farads per meter all right when you start denoting all the passives like this it's a clear indication to a circuit designer that you are talking about distributed parameters not lumped parameters okay so it gives them an idea clearly that you are not talking about low frequency circuit analysis but you are actually considering the tiniest delays possible in your circuit and account for it very very clearly okay now that we have divided this the natural question that comes to the mind is a given transmission line or a given set of wires all right which are represented by this circuit is going to have delta z to be very small and you will have the circuit repeating again and again and it is not going to be easy to solve for the loop currents or the node voltages because you have an enormous number of nodes and enormous number of loops okay and uh, is it possible to do some analysis in a cleaner analytical manner that's the question since these are identical units repeating again and again one could always say that we could evaluate the quantities i and v for a given unit and then try to see what meaning we can arrive using that unit cell to build the complete picture of this entire circuit okay so the analysis is usually done using a single unit cell right okay so we can start with a single unit cell and say this is r delta z series with l delta z g 
जी डेल्टा जेड and it is a small section of your entire circuit it is the repeating unit we will call this portion with a space coordinate of z this portion will be z plus delta z okay so we can say that the voltage here is vn and the voltage here so v out right the current that is entering this particular portion of the circuit can be i in the current that is coming out here is i out okay <coughs> so we can start to write down some equations which relate v in to v out i in to i out etc okay but before we start doing this let's make our job a little bit simpler okay we started with the circuit that has r l g and c okay suppose we consider a scenario where the lines are ideal that is they don't have any loss or resistance at all we could go for one more level of approximation and reduce the amount of math that you need to do to arrive at an analytical expression so let us start by simple case that is the line is ideal all right and your dielectric that is between the top and the bottom layers of the pcb is an ideal dielectric doesn't have any trickling conductance going from the top to the bottom if that is the case you don't have any conductance between your two layers of the pcb and you have infinite conductivity between the top uh, layers of the pcb which means that r is equal to 0 and g is equal to 0 it's an approximation this approximation is usually referred to as a lossless okay so it reduces the number of components for which we need to uh, derive an analytical expression for the voltage so i'll do this for r equal to 0 and g equal to 0 first later on in the course once we are comfortable in handling this lossless approximation we'll go for the full lossy approximation which is more indicative of what will happen in reality okay so now your lossless case you have v of z v of z plus delta z i of z coming into the circuit i of z plus delta z going out and our job is to simply find out the relationship between the input and the output quantities and we are saying that this is a transmission line transmission line now i think we are comfortable to define what is a transmission line transmission line is uh, a branch of this electric circuits where we are dealing with very long interconnections where the transit times are comparable to the period all right and the frequencies are very high okay so in such a case we have to divide even a short circuit into a number of smaller elements where you can apply kcl and kvl and when you indicate such a unit cell it is abundantly clear to the designer that you are considering time transit effects okay so now we can apply kvl all right so we go around the loop and we apply kirchhoff's voltage law so we can start with the voltage on the left side v of z minus the drop on the inductor that is going to be l delta z di dt okay minus the voltage across the capacitor has to be equal to 0 right so that we have minus v of z plus delta z this is using kirchhoff's voltage law okay. 
Now, though I have written di by dt, all right, which is consistent with your low frequency circuit analysis, we learn that V is equal to L d i d t in low frequency circuit analysis. We have introduced space in our circuit already, all right, and we also know that the space and the time are going to be dictating the velocity, that means they are related in some way. It means that uh, the current as we have indicated in the diagram is a function of space i of z, i of z plus delta z, we have written that it is function of space, all right. So this means that the current is going to be dependent both on space and on time, all right. So the correct way to write this equation is not using ordinary derivatives but actually using partial derivatives, okay. So the correct way to write this now will be v of z minus l delta z. Now one of the things that we can do is actually rearrange this equation. We can take V of Z plus delta Z and V of Z on one side, right. So we can have V of Z plus delta Z minus V of Z, it is going to be L delta Z dou I dou Z. <coughs> we can also bring the delta Z to the denominator on the left hand side. I think I missed a minus sign in the previous step, so, right. L D I D T, how can I miss this? <coughs> okay. So, the left hand side corresponds to a discrete approximation of a derivative. So if delta z is really, really, really tiny as delta z tends to 0, the left hand side becomes simply derivative of v with respect to z okay. is equal to minus l is that correct? This is a very important equation and for people who have studied circuit analysis in your undergraduate, you may not have seen a derivative of voltage with respect to space in a circuit analysis. So for the first time we are having space being treated as an independent variable in circuit analysis. So previously we just had voltage is equal to L d i d t but now we are having dou v by dou z is minus L dou i dou t. Now similarly, if one were to use KCL or Kirchhoff's current law, right, so you will have the incoming current I of Z minus the current going through the capacitor branch, okay, so that can be represented as C delta Z dou V dou T minus I of Z plus delta Z is equal to 0. This can be rearranged as delta Z tends to 0, which is a very small section, we will be having dou I by dou Z is minus C. So now we have two equations, one equation has been obtained by using KVL and the other equation has been obtained using KCL and in both of these cases we notice something, spatial derivative of voltage is dependent on time derivative of current and spatial derivative of current is dependent on time derivative of voltage. I believe that for a person who has studied circuit analysis in the undergraduate this will be the first time they are actually seeing space derivatives and time derivatives coming on each sides, right. So we will stop here. The names of the equations that we have written down are is uh, telegraphers equations.
and these are the starting point for analysis of transmission lines. So, to summarize what we studied in this particular lecture, we saw that we could connect different ICs on a PCB using interconnects or a source and a sink that are very well separated using some ideal short circuit lines. But uh, when your frequency is high and when the transit time between the two edges of your line is considerable, then you will have to think about using KCL, KVL for your analysis, it is not going to be easy to apply. So, you have to divide your transmission line into a number of small sections and to account for the delay, you have to use RL and RC. And to minimize the analysis, we have assumed that R and G are going to be 0. In this particular approximation, we know we call it as a lossless transmission line approximation. And once we do this approximation, we get some equations governing the current and the voltage in these circuits, which is space derivative corresponds to time derivative of the other quantity. Okay? So, we will stop here and we will meet for the next lecture in the same place. Thank you.